Okay. Great. Um, good We're evening, everyone. Recorded. Great. Good evening, everyone. It's 637. And I'm calling the March 8th meeting of the Finance and Budget Commission to order. I'm going to take attendance by roll call. Uh, Commissioner Beeman? Commissioner Here. Beeman? Great, Sorry. thank you. Mute. Commissioner Busby? Commissioner Busby, I think you're muted. My apologies, my apologies. No worries, thank you. Um, Commissioner Jacobs? Here. Commissioner Neville, here. Commissioner Salmon? Here. Commissioner Sandino? Here. Commissioner Sufi? Here. Great, thank you everyone. So um, our next order of business is the approval of the agenda for this evening's meeting. Elena, is there any public comment on the agenda? Let me check real quick. I move approval um, as written. Just a second. And I'll second. Yep. Doesn't look like anyone wants to speak. Great, thank you. So the motion to approve was made by Commissioner Solomon and seconded by Commissioner Jacobs. And I'll call the roll. Commissioner Beeman? Aye. Commissioner Busby? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Neville? Aye. Commissioner Salmon? Aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Great. Perfect. So we next we move to item three, brief announcements from staff, chair, commissioners, and liaisons. Um, can I start with our council liaisons? If uh, Council Member Carson and Chapman, if you have any updates for us. No, the only thing I would mention, Donna, is that uh, relevant to the item on the agenda tonight, uh, we were scheduled on March 23 to have a city council workshop on goal setting and, and objectives. And uh, so we'll be looking forward and appreciative of whatever guidance you give us. Great, thank you. Council Member Chapman, any updates or announcements? No, nope, not this evening. Council Member Carson covered them. Thank Great, you. thank you. Um, Elena, did you have any um, updates for us? Well, not really an update, but I did want to remind everybody since this would be our last chance or my last chance to remind everyone that um, applications for the FBC Commission are due uh, on March 12th. So if um, you want to reapply or if you are aware of anybody who might be interested, this would be um, a great opportunity. And like I said, the next meeting would be already too late. So I just wanted to get everybody up. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any updates? Aside from status updates on your work groups, any announcements or anything? I'm uh, not seeing any raised hands. Great. And I have no announcements. So we will move to item four. And this is for general public comment. That is public comment on items that are not on this evening's agenda. And you can submit those in writing to FBC at cityofdavis.org. Um, and I, do, I have not received any that were submitted prior to the meeting. Um, I, um, I have not that. seen any either, Donna. And if anybody would like to speak, if you're on the phone, please press star nine. And if you're on Zoom, please raise your hand uh, in case you want to talk about something that's not on the agenda. And I see none, Donna. Okay, thank you. And number item number five, our consent calendar. We just have one item there, and that is the approval of the minutes from our last meeting, February 8th. Are there any corrections to the minutes? I had one uh, question. It says, I think during roll call that I seconded it. And then in the next item, it says that I showed up at the next item. So minor thing. I don't, sorry, this is Beeman. I, I'm not seeing where it says that. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Okay. So under, I think it was approval. Sorry, I got to get the agenda. Quick. 
of oh, the agenda. I see, I see approval of the agenda. Yes, yes. Um, yes, I see what happened there. Um, you did come in a little bit late and you did not actually make that second. So I need to go back and, and I'll correct that. You're right. I, I know you entered the meeting a little bit later. Um, so uh, I'll, cor I'll correct that. I'll go back to the tape and see who made the second. I'm and, working on my teleportation. You know, we, had, we had a little bit of a problem because we were, although we were broadcasting, we were not um, recording those first two items. So I could only go back to the tape starting a little bit later in the meeting. And I know when you came in and we did record it then. If anyone remembers that they seconded that item, they should speak now <laughs> because I can correct it. Otherwise, I don't know how to, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to correct it. I don't have a perfect memory. Hmm. So Paul, did you have a comment? I, my only comment on the, uh, on the minutes is that there is a duplication. I don't think it was intentional. On the bottom of page three, you twi you you call for comments yeah. at the bottom, and then yeah. So I did. I did call for public comment twice. I had already called for it earlier in the item, and I was, it was suggested I should call for it again. So I reflected that in the minutes. Did you? But but what did it come after the roll call? It came exactly in the order that it appears there. So in other like, words, you it says you asked again. I did. And then it says the roll call. And then you ask one more time after the roll call. I, I think that's an error and you should just strike it. No, no, it's no? okay. It, it's not. Never I mind. know what you're saying. It's the vote was on the motion, and then I was reminded to call for public comment again. So it, it is correct. Okay. But I, I know what you're saying. I had to go back and look at it a few times myself. So that was a long item. Okay. Thanks. So um Ezra, I don't know if we can correct who made that second on that early item because we don't have that on tape, unfortunately, but I agree it wasn't you. <laughs> so, um, so other than that, are there any concerns or corrections? I'm seeing none. Is there a motion to approve the almost correct <laughs> minutes? I so move. Okay. Second, Solomon. And seconded by Commissioner Solomon. I'll call the roll. Uh, Commissioner Beeman. We need to see if we have public Hi. comment. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Elena. Do we have any public comment on the minutes? Uh, I see none. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you for the reminder. Um, Commissioner Busby. Uh, aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Neville. Aye. Commissioner Salomon. Aye. Commissioner Sandino. Aye. Commissioner Sufi. Aye. Fantastic. All right. So we are now moving into the meat of our agenda. We really have kind of two substantive items. And this first one, we're moving into item 6A. And that is a discussion related to city council goals and priorities. And you do have an attachment attached to the agenda that's kind of important. That's going to be a key document that we're going to go through tonight. And Elaine, I think you were going to give just a little bit of a lead off to this item and tell us what council had asked of us. Yes. Um, thank you, Donna. Um, so just to start off, that the city council um, did initiate the process to adopt their 2021-22 fiscal year goals and priorities. Um, a goal setting session uh, will be held on March 23rd of this year and um, Council will consider an updated goals document on April 6th after that at the Council meeting. So I um, just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. I know that Council Member um, Dan Carson mentioned that earlier in the announcement, but just as an FYI, and also um, the City Council has requested um, Commission uh, work plans to be provided to inform um, their discussion on March 23rd. Um, we obviously are coordinating with all of you, and this is your opportunity um, to provide the work plans, discuss and provide the work plans to the City Council. Um, this uh, will involve like your um, commission activities, focus areas and objectives. Um, if commission decides not to have a formal work plan, um, you can do um, a summary uh, provided to the commission priority focus areas and task 
for the upcoming year. Um, there's two ways you can do it. Obviously, you can do it as a commission, which I believe you've decided to do it that way, uh, part of the discussion tonight. Um, I also wanted to make sure that with uh, the during a council meeting when the, this was discussed, uh, they also said that the commissioners may come in as private citizens and make um, their statements as well. Um, so at the March 23rd meeting. Um, with that, I will turn it over to you and uh, we'll move this discussion forward. Great, thanks, Elena. That's a great recap. So um, what I envision us doing tonight, we, um, we, as you know, we do have work plans that the different subcommittees have put together and I can certainly provide those to city council. But I think that the document that the city council is using as a kind of organic working document is really, really helpful because it shows what the city's current goals are, priorities, and some of the very specific actions that they've been trying to take in order to achieve those goals. And what I was hoping that we could do this evening is go through, particularly with a focus on the areas in that document that are sort of most relevant to what we do. And if we have, um, particular, let's say, um, priorities, or if we have things that aren't, aren't there that we think should be there, we'd like to suggest that to council, that would be helpful. But also, secondarily, if there are priorities this, that we know the city has that where we think we could be helpful, I think we should note those. So we'll, I wanna kind of go through the document section by section and, um, and I'm gonna take copious notes and just see what suggestions we have. And then after the meeting, I'll probably put together a more, a coherent document. I'm not gonna to try to write that document in this meeting. So Lena, if you could share the city council goals and objectives document, that would be great. And it starts out with, as you probably saw these fairly, and we can go to the next page where it has the goals. So there it has just right, just back one page. Just perfect. So you as it okay. see, I need to make it bigger. Um, um, I'm almost able to read it. <laughs> Other people may want it slightly bigger. I don't know. That's probably a little better. So as you know, it starts out with these eight fairly high level goals. I don't think the city council is really looking for us to kind of modify its overarching goals, um, you know, so we, we could wordsmith those, but I don't know that there's a lot of value in that. I think it's more important and meaningful if we turn more to some of the specific priority priorities that are broken down according to those goals and go through them. And if we have things we think we should add, that would be great. Um, or if we think that there's a way something should really be prioritized, I think we should note that. So if we can move down in the document to... That first, yeah, so the fiscal resilience. So we go to that, good, that's good, yeah. So if we go to fiscal resilience, are there items, action items under here that we think are missing, that are important, that we think the city should, should be undertaking, that we can suggest? Or something that's not here that we know about that falls under this category? Donna, David, has his hand up? Oh, yes, please. I, I, I have actually a different point I want to make first, and then I, I'll get to your suggestion. So um, my goal is just how the document was prepared. And uh, I know there's always limits on time, but the document to me um, didn't contain all the information that I would want as a manager if I was managing this, these goals. So I'll throw that out for as food for thought. So there's action items and an update, but I don't have here who's responsible for that action item. Maybe it's obvious to the folks that are working on it, but it wouldn't be to me. Um, so what, what unit within the city and who within that unit's responsible for it. I also don't see here uh, the next steps there's an update, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a next step. Mm -hmm. And I also don't see a, um, a, uh, a completion date. Uh, when is this supposed to be done? So I think uh, 
those that kind of information might be helpful. I don't know, maybe that's not the level of detail the council would want, but that would be some food for thought. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the commission goes, um, it's another possible column to add is that to identify if any of these items are that are still pending are subject to commission review, whether it's this yeah. commission, planning commission, social services. Uh, I note that in that first goal one, the way I read it, uh, complete development impact fee studies, I see that as parallel or identical to what um, Ezra and his subcommittee is working on economic impact. So right. maybe if there was another column, if that's true, if there was another column identifying which of the uh, different commissions are working on the matters, that would be a helpful bit of information for the council. Uh, so that, those are just some ideas. Um, I do agree, you said, what about priorities? Um, I think that would be another useful addition. I, uh, this is the first time I've seen this chart and I see scores of different goals and action items, some of which have been completed, but many which have not. And um, I think it would be helpful to identify whether this is high priority, medium priority or low priority. So people get a sense as to you know, what, what, uh, what the city's focused on. So those are, those are my comments mostly offered as food for thought. No, great, great ideas. And, and a big part of this is, this is a kind of a high level tool for city council when it has this really intensive workshop on the 23rd. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that we can do here. I, I think we can, you know, indicate, in fact, that's one of the things I want as a takeaway is if there are areas here that we are working on, I want to indicate that so council knows and knows that we're already trying to do something to assist them. And yes, I think that would be useful information for them. Um, Donna, yes? Donna oh, sorry, this is Elena. I just wanted to kind of give a quick heads up for all the commissioners that um, the staff have previously, when these goals were updated, not this past meeting, of course, but um, when this chart was updated, it did include um, a lot of the information that David just suggested. Uh, my understanding is because of the time, not all of those components were included, but it was previously updated with that information. So okay, okay, so it exists somewhere as a yes, as a management tool. Um, good. So that's good to know. So can we kind of look through this goal one, ensure fiscal resilience? And like, for example, um, I'm just going to throw out a couple of ideas. On B, complete the user fee study. Uh, that sort of spoke to me and I said, oh, FBC, you know, we should have a role in that. We should indicate in our communication to council, we'd like to be of assistance with that. Um, same thing with item C. Um, I don't know where, but again, I don't know just where that is. It's just pending, but that's something we could do some research. We could help on that. Same thing with D, as, as David said, we already know one of our subcommittees is doing some work on that. So in our communication to council, we should indicate that and let them know that this is an issue that we've already, we're doing some analysis on too, and that we think is important. So those are all things I already had highlighted. Um, are there other comments about this goal one? Is there something that we know is important that isn't we don't see here? I'm trying to raise my hand. Oh, um, are you? Sorry, I did There we not. go. I'm on my phone. <laughs> oh, okay. Would be see now. Put your hand now. I said, please go ahead. So on goal one, um, <clears throat> two, sorry, this is goal one, objective one, two ideas um that i thought were worth considering one is benchmarking so <clears throat> one of the things that we learned in looking at cost of service was there was also data on revenue per person um and just looking at the cost of service is only half the story and what it brought to my attention anyway was that some cities are doing better than others and i'm just talking about in our near-term area places like Folsom, roseville in particular um, are doing pretty good at um, increasing their revenues per capita. So I feel like, and it's probably been done before, um, but maybe it's time to do it again, uh, but to really understand where, where are they getting revenues and you know, it'll be the normal stuff like, well, you need a giant mall in Roseville, but 
there might be more than that. Um, so that's one suggestion. Uh, yeah. The second one is cannabis. As well, uh, I, as well, can you kind of step me through that a little more? Because I know it's something you've mentioned before, and I want to make sure. Different kind I'm of benchmarking. How to, how to transfer it into a particular action item that we would suggest to council. So you said Roseville and what other city are doing it? Well, when I looked at um, costs versus revenues per capita, Mm -hmm. um, those particular cities were doing better than average uh, in generating revenue per capita. Mm -hmm. And you could say Roseville, you know, they've got a big Galleria. And I guess Folsom does as well if you go up 50. Mm -hmm. But it might be that there's more to it. And it's something I think that the, it's actually one of our recommendations in the forthcoming paper is that we look at the, um, the what other cities are doing in our region um, to improve their revenue per capita. So this is just so, benchmarking revenue generation. Okay, so the recommendation that we might craft would, would to the city would say use benchmarking to measure revenue produced per capita, how much revenue is generated per capita. Um, and then you know, we want, might indicate that FPC could do some research and assist with this. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, you look for who's doing it the best and you, you know, yeah. get the top three and you go look at what they're doing and you see if there's anything we can learn from it. Okay, that's interesting. You've raised that before. Mostly on the cost side. And the Donna, other, also, go ahead. No, I just wanted to make sure to Donna that uh, Paul has comments as well. He has his hand up. So yeah. after Ezra, do you finish? Yeah, I got it. I see him, thank you. Ahead, the, other, the other suggestion is to just maybe review our cannabis licenses. Um, I mean, I noticed the one that's downtown uh, near where I live. Uh, it's got people standing outside of it almost all the time. So I just wonder if there's an opportunity maybe uh, in other places to um, uh, increase the licensing uh, for cannabis. I'm going to note these and I'm, we're going to kind of come back to this. I'm trying to do a good job of <laughs> assembling them because I know not everyone may want to make that second recommendation, but, or even the first, but I just want to make sure I get them all down. Paul, please go ahead. I have a couple sort of the highest level of, uh, <clears throat> of comment. I mean, pulling back, <laughs> I find this document difficult. I know that this approach is very standard in government and, increasingly probably in business. But the way this is organized, I think there's a lot of redundancy. I notice things are mentioned more than once or in different ways in different sections. And I wonder if, probably it's too late for this go round, but I would not organize this by goals. I would organize this according to departments. I would also <clears throat> identify goals that are completed, in progress, delayed, and not yet begun, which I, I think is one of David's thoughts uh, in a way, mm -hmm. or expanding on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you organized it in that way, you would see what have they accomplished, uh, what have they done, and what's, what's still pending. I like the idea of target dates. So that's the high level look at it. I, th I find this a difficult as a lay person looking at this as a citizen, I find this daunting. So um, I think it could be improved, but well, maybe I, that's I, for the next go around. Well, I appreciate your comment about, and it's similar to David's comments too. Um, one of the things that Mayor Partita did ask was, you know, are we even organizing this big document in a way that makes sense, you know, and I, and I think you're right. And there's, there's a lot to be said for organizing things more around the functional unit or the department that's really responsible and knowing, you know, are they on track? Are they getting it done? If not, what's the reason? All of those things are really important because they help you with budget priorities. Yeah. So they're all important points. Um, I know this is a, has become a standard way of doing it. You said goals yeah. and objectives right. and you have the details. But I think it, it can trap you into something that is not as usable as, as we'd like. Mm -hmm. um, I have one other comment in terms of the question about fiscal resilience, something that we, and also an aim for the commission, is we have not talked about, David and his subcommittee have talked about 
contracts and looking at specific contracts. And I think in terms of contracting out and contracting services, which cities and including Davis have done a lot of, it would be very useful for this commission, for staff to have a complete list of contracts, of, of contracted services with such items as when was it completed? When is it due? Because in the past we've run into kind of renewals that were kind of automatic, even though city policy generally recommended going out for proposals again or for bid. And I, and, and I also know from a conversation uh, with another, uh, with uh, I think this came from my conversation with Gherkin or Kern about the, the uh, following item on our agenda, but people acquire software and, and pay annual fees. I know this, I, I do this with Microsoft. And then they'd stop using it and they're still paying the fees. I mean, we might wanna look globally at what the city is contracted to do and pay and how much of it is really useful and is being used and how much of it had, could be subject to another round of, of uh, bidding. Uh, I, I don't see anything like that in this document. Yeah, it could be no, a way to not. save some money, actually, yeah. which is yes, why I think there it, is there is a place for it. So let's kind of hold. I, I'm I've taken notes on that, but there is a little bit more of an anchor to that issue when we get farther into the document. Right. Okay. Um, but um, so let's talk a little bit about two B. Um, and I I understand the challenges with the document too. I you know I. I know because we don't have a lot of context and we're just sort of doing our best. Um, but I think on two, and Paul, I think this is where your concern about um, the ERP software is really important under 2B. You you feel- Yeah, I, ERB, ERB, I think has long been uh, something supported which, which basically is for, for anybody listening is, is really business software is how I think of it that allows the city to look at any kind of level it wants down to individual expenditures if need be of how the city is spending its money and how efficiently it's operating. And the commission long ago identified this as crucial, important money has, some money has already been set aside for it. I know it's been delayed. We brought it up last meeting. It's been delayed about because of COVID, which of course makes perfect sense. You, how can you have staff training in a new computer system? But I think this should be one of the highest priorities of the city. Uh, uh, throughout this, in, in various places in this document, there are referrals to acquired new software right, to do right. one thing or another. But some of those things might well have been uh, included in a new, uh, a new business uh, software more globally, and it would be more useful because it could be shared. Yeah, and we don't know. I had the same concern, but we don't know. We, we can't tell from this document, but it's a good point. Uh, it's just something to bring up as yeah. at the council. I'm sure Dan is aware of it. Josh by now is probably aware of it, but but I think we should emphasize it. And we can be helpful in this area. Not only are some, uh, some of our commissioners have worked on this before, and we know some outside people who would probably be delighted to come back as outsiders and help advise <laughs> us or give us information on this. Uh, former commissioner Bill Wood would be, yeah. uh, might be amenable to, to helping us steer through this. No, you're good. Um, so I want to on um, just move us along a little bit. So on on two C, and this is where I was thinking, Paul. It, obviously, it's not directly related to what you just said about taking a look at what we contract out for now. This is this is a different issue. This is look at whether there are other service delivery models. In other words, should we contract out for things that we now do in house? But the counterpoint to that, of course, is 
what are we contracting out for now? And is it providing usefulness? It's almost like that should have been added there as well as a suggestion. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think there are areas where we may now, where contracting out has not worked so well. Mm -hmm. um, and we may want to examine that. Right. Um, other things under 2B, other thoughts or ideas? Um, again, I, I have so my hand up. I see oh, others do too. Uh, sorry, I'm yeah, that's sorry. Okay. I'm, you may not be able to see the hand, so I'm just going to be more, now, more aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> so, I can see um, you now. So it's, since uh, we were talking about 2C and contracting, um, I, uh, and adding more information. So just a, a reminder, uh, the subcommittee that I'm working on, which is a subcommittee of one basically, was this idea to take a look at a large procurement by uh, fire or police and the entire contracting process and whether that, whether that procurement model um, was maximizing efficiency for the city. That's, that was sort of what I was thinking and it, it fell under the category of, of public safety. So that to me is related to C. C is broader and, and could be also something the, uh, the uh, commission could help with, but it's a bigger ask because you're talking now not just about goods, which I thought were a good uh, a product like, like a fire truck versus trying to look at services delivered, consulting services, much more difficult to measure and whether you're getting value. And now you're in this kind of tough area of govern government in terms of being able to manage service contracts effectively by all government studies. That's one of the weaknesses of government. So. My, my thought on this one would be to add my, my committee a, as one of the possible sub, um, subcommittee works on this subject, but there's, there's, there's bigger fish to fry if the commission or others were more interested in expanding the look at uh, contracting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a really important area. Um, and so for us tonight, we're focused more on sort of what we want to say to council about their discussion for their goals and priorities, but we could put as one of them that we could do this work related to service contracts. We could do some analysis. And you're right, it is a big a big uh, chunk. We um, can do services and, and you can decide whether you want, want to mention we're trying, or at least I'm trying to do something like that with the public safety contract. Yes. We'll point out, I guess, when we get there, how difficult it is to even corral these contracts. So it, it, it's a bigger ask than it might appear. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Um, Ezra, you have your hand up. I can see hands up now. I don't know why I wasn't seeing I think that was from before. I'm waiting for the next objective too. Oh, so you just thought you'd put your hand up early. <laughs> I'm just being preemptive. <laughs> okay, so we're on, we're on 2B. Donna, um, Gertrude had earlier a um, hand up. I need to load oh, it. I don't see the hand up. Yes, I did have my hand up, but it was just to, to okay. piggyback off of um, what Paul had mentioned. But you had you had already kind of touched on it when we moved to 2C. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just have to ask Elena something. I'm getting messages on my phone that the Zoom link says our meeting is over, and it's apparently telling people that when they sign in, the meeting is, has ended. So we need to make sure that we are actually broadcasting. Well, we do have an attendee um, in our meeting. So um, I'm not certain why it's doing this. Is that person on the phone or Zoom? Um, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> Point so, of order, Madam Chair. Let me look in the Zoom account, this is Kelly, and see if I can figure out what's going on. There was an email that, that we received that said somebody could not get in the link. I tried the public link before I even came in and it didn't work. So I'm not sure what's going on. Hmm. Thank you. Should we wait till we're sure or should we go ahead? If we have people who are on the link, it seems like we're working. I just would hate to be 
doing business and not and then have to go back and redo it because we weren't broadcasting. So I received a uh, text message from a member of the public, Madam Chair, that the Zoom link says the meeting is over. Yes. My question to you is, can we lawfully continue the meeting if somebody, more, one or more citizens came in to attend this and were now advised that it had terminated? Yeah, if we're not broadcasting, we can't conduct business if we're not accessible to the public. So Kelly's checking. Um, oh, I know the my, phone is working, so you're right. We're, we're trying to figure yeah. out. If, if we're not, not accessible, we can't conduct business. Yeah, that's not my question. My question is, since we have told people effectively the meeting is over, can we now resume the meeting? Oh, but I don't. Okay, I, I, I understand. That's different. You're right. Um, and we're trying to figure out what, what's really happening here. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I am getting an error message. Um, if I try to log in on my phone. Okay. Um, what I'm going to suggest is um, if we could just take a recess sure. and let me see if we can let me see what we can figure out. It's a little bit tricky because we've already started the meeting. Yeah. And, so and, yeah, I'm less worried about having started the meeting because I think it was accessible and, and it's fine if we have to do it over. But if if we're not live at, and especially if the message has indicated to people the meeting is over, then even if we resume, they're not they're not going to know to come back and, it, and I don't think it's adequate notice, unfortunately. So if you guys will, I'm going to disappear again and okay. see if I can hunt down um, our clerk and our tech person. Should we just stay on hold here? I assume we're just staying on hold. I think the best thing to do is just to take a, yeah, just to take a, a five minute recess okay. and, and then okay. adjourn, or not adjourn, but come back, hang on. We'll do. You know, if we had a Twitter, we could tell everyone, come back. You might find some demographics wouldn't, uh, <laughs> wouldn't get the message. Yeah, I, I figured that after I said it. I'd have to get my own Twitter account, for example. I actually don't use Twitter very much. It, it, it's like a, a little bit of a cesspool. Well, see, I'm of a generation, right? That we only had Air 80 characters for the entire computer and I'm not going back. Oh, goodness. Um, I guess, do, do the commissions have like any social media of any sort? Facebook or anything along those lines? Some, some way to like stay connected with us? Some do. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's like part of the communication thing. Yeah.
Okay, folks. So the I went straight to the top. I called the city clerk. <laughs> um, she was able to get in via her phone and through her desktop. Um, so she tried two different ways in two different emails. Both worked fine. Um, we do have another person who has entered as well. So there may be some problems, but they're not on our end. So she's comfortable proceeding with the meeting. If you guys are. Um, I'm just, do we know why some people are using that same link and getting a message? Apparently the message said that the meeting, no such meeting existed or that the meeting had expired and that was on the web link but you're not having any trouble. And I know I didn't have any trouble either when I signed in. Yeah, as I said, I did it I did it earlier when there was an, an email that had yeah. come in. Can we contact check. that person that was having just, trouble you know, with the email and ask them if they can try again? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing that now. I, well, I, I did send them a message already. Okay. And they haven't responded, but I don't, I don't have an email, so. Okay. Oh, it's working now, so I feel even better. So now it's working for that person, and you've all checked it, so let's continue. So, okay, it's all good. Thank you for checking. So um, under, so we're back on, we're streaming, and we're recording and everything. Whoops. Wait, we're recording. Very good. And we're back to the same um, spot, okay. goal one. Thank you. So to move into um, objective three, transparency, um, under the first section or all of that section, are there thoughts about items that are not there that should be there, um, areas where we can um, work on? I know, for example, on A, um, action item A is working with the fiscal subcommittee for the city council to review and prioritize certain recommendations they've made. We will be coordinating with that fiscal subcommittee as we do our budget review that will be happening. Um, other, um, uh, other issues there, I see several where I think we should be involved and should explain what work we're doing so council knows. Under B, we're looking at issues related to the, the fund balance in water and sewer. Um, are there other thoughts and concerns about that section? And several of these, it's it's really obvious we're doing work in them. We're doing work on, on B, we're doing work on F, we're doing work on, well, we're not, well, we're not really doing work on I. Uh, J and K are both things that we can work on, the communication subcommittee can work on. No thoughts there, okay. So. Um, Donna? Yes? Just, just a question for clarification. Um, is our goal to just propose any changes to the action items and adjust, uh, objectives mentioned here? or to point out which things we want to work on? Both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. To, you know, and also to be informational. Um, if we're doing work on it and council may not even know, we'll put together a communication. I'm not, I haven't figured out the format of that communication yet exactly, but these are all good ideas. You know, I don't, I'm not hearing anything where I think we are in disagreement with one another. Um, yeah. 
I don't know how widely known it is, but I mean, I, we, I've mentioned this before to the commission, but our subcommittee on communications now has a different membership, but uh, with now Donna is on it, but we have done a number of things, including uh, submitted a draft of a pavement improvement uh, project mailer. And uh, the city is, uh, according to this document, is working on such a mailer and hopefully our suggestions will prove helpful. So on the whole subject of mailers having to do with fiscal issues, not policy issues, but fiscal issues, uh, I think we will, should, and I believe will continue to make an effort. And that does show up in several places. Right. On um, moving on to page five, are there, again, there's action items there where we could be useful. It seems really clear to me. Uh, certainly A, we could help with that if council wanted our help. Um, other thoughts on providing a robust support network for business. I would, can I, if I can take a really quick turn, we have several people on this commission who are doing business from offices in Davis and probably know a lot and may have connections made to other people, may uh, understand what the needs are. And I think we could play a very active role in looking at the inventory of properties that are available for commercial development in Davis and perhaps coming up with some interesting uses of that property, those properties that could attract uh, proposals that could attract uh, uh, developers or uh, companies who would be interested in being near such, near the university and working in Davis. Yeah, that's what I thought Ezra and, and Ezra does have his hand up now. Ezra, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so the, the thing that I, was going to put forward here is the local preference paper that is still in committee, but I do have feedback. It's, I think it's on me, um, but this is something that um, many of the nearby communities have implemented and I think could be used to support and foster local business. So stay tuned. We'll call that D. So at that, so I think because that's something that is still in progress and you're working on it, certainly fine to mention to council that you're working on a proposal and explain to them what that is. Um, yeah. So um, objective two under goal two. Um, thoughts there. Um, some of these are getting a little bit into land use issues that are not completely in our jurisdiction a little bit. One but, question I had, and maybe staff can speak to this is, um, have we done, I think we've done an inventory and I guess the, a classic study is understanding what a surplus to needs and yeah, or, you know, selling the property on Fifth Street, I'm, you know, which is a, a got all kinds of uses, but, you know, moving it to the periphery, that sort of um, uh, transaction that could potentially free up a lot of capital. But I imagine that must have been looked at. I, Do we have a surplus property inventory, Elena, where we know, or, or where we've even designated things as surplus? I... Do not know the answer to that question, so I have to find out. So. Um, I'm going to move to objective three, unless I'm seeing more questions here. Um, address the needs of new businesses and business types identified as desirable additions to our economic diversity and sustainability. Um, and that's where the inventory of space for economic development center is. It's now complete. Um, let's see, return to council. 
a lot of this is sort of centered around the downtown plan. Um, I don't have any suggestions in that area, but if others do, I'm happy to hear them. I'm not seeing any. I'm gonna turn now, then I'm gonna move through to goal three and, and not because I don't care about these issues, I care very much about environmental sustainability and issues related to that, but much of what is in here is something that is more suitable for other commissions than us. So in the interest of time, unless there's some specific thing that you think finance and budget could do, I'm not seeing a place for us in, object, in goal three and, and all the way through goal three, really. Not that I don't think it's incredibly important, it is. <laughs> so just not that I, David, please go ahead. Can I, can I actually jump back to goal two and add something? I just don't know where exactly it would fit. Uh -huh. um, and the reality is that there's a lot of excess property that the University of California Davis actually owns. Um, for example, I, I work by a large greenhouse complex mm -hmm. that is just sitting idle and that's been a, a need. So I don't know if there are potential collaborations or synergies that can be worked out between these two institutions, the city and the UC. Um, I don't know if that fits uh, here. Yeah, I mean, their surplus property is kind of governed by their world. It's not like cities and school mm -hmm. districts where there is some collaborative stuff mm -hmm. involving surplus property sales. So Definitely. I'm not sure we benefit from that. David, you had your hand up. I, I do. Um, so uh, just to re-emphasize a point I made that I think you were right that uh, this area relating to the environment, there's other commissions that were probably more focused on that, whether it's the Planning Commission or the Natural Resources Commission. And if, if they were identified, if we had this other column that someone else is wor working on it, that makes sense. I do see a possibility for things that this commission could do focusing on fiscal finances on each one of these, if we wanted to, we could do a, a, a financial analysis or a fiscal analysis of this implementation of the city's climate action plan. What, what, does, what are the consequences? What are, what are the costs? What are the benefits? So all of these have fiscal impacts, but I think the driving policy isn't, at least at the outset, isn't coming from, from this group. It's coming from one of the other commissions. And so I do think another column would be helpful. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so I'm going to move to goal four, and I want to hear thoughts for um, items that should be there or ways that we should be helping. Yes, so under objective one, um, one thought has been, and we've been working, the community development subcommittee was working on this with uh, Michelle and Ezra and I um, before, before we stopped working on it, um, and it was specific to how um, the delivery of CI project rates, so uh, how many of them are on time and how many of them are on budget um, is something that is kind of surprising. And actually it comes up again, um, even in this fire station review, because we'll plan for, uh, for example, 16, 17, we were supposed to spend 1.5 million on a fire station review and we've only spent about 8,000 of that. And that was back in 2016, 2017. Um, and then you go into more of these CIP projects and you'll find one project was supposed to, I can pull up the number here, um, eight, eight, two, three, three, I believe this is the VMC rehab. It was intended, intended to be a $1.2 million project that ended in 2016, 2017 and it, or 2017, 2018 and added another 700,000 and it was delivered a year late. So the question starts to become, how well are we delivering our current CIP projects? And is there a pool of money that is sitting there for unfulfilled CIP? So I would hope that we have this really sophisticated way of measuring those projects, but you're right, I don't know what we do. And it's something we, we 
could easily look into as a commission. It's a really, it's really important. One of the issues we've brought up to piggyback on what Ger Kern said, the, um, this seems to be a capacity issue that right. a lot of projects are listed and aren't fulfilled and they just sit there and perhaps some of the money that's been allocated for them just sits there doing nothing and earning next to nothing as Ray has often pointed out. Um, I don't know where that, this whole capacity, do we have the staff capacity to move projects or what's holding them up? Uh, somehow that seems to be a central issue that keeps coming up in different ways. And I don't know how we look at that or whether the council needs to look at it or the city manager himself, but uh, to me, this is a, a very important issue. I would, I would propose adding before action item A, uh, like a public works review. So review capital improvement plot projects that are currently in the works. Very, a very specific additional action item. Hi, uh, Donna. Yep. I, I just wanna um, echo Gokuren and um, Paul's sentiment here. I mean, I think it, 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 it's, it would have such a huge impact on quality of life here if we actually spent the money that has been earmarked for projects. I mean, if, if we've got money for a park or the swing and it's not been built, then we're not getting the amenity of that swing. And so you could rapidly improve the quality of life of people in this community by just delivering all that stuff. So I do think that delivery capacity should, re and I, I quickly scanned all of the things again, and I could not find anybody speaking to, or any of these speaking to delivery capacity, but I could have missed it. There's like 50, but I think it would belong here. Yeah. So the more we go through this, the more I, I am struck by how difficult it is. And it's not that this isn't a useful document, but there's so much context we don't have. We don't know, for example, if there isn't this great project management tool that the city has that shows it exactly what its estimated budget and all these projects are, what their status is, where the cost overruns are, what the cost, we don't know. It could exist today and we just don't know. Oh, there is a capital plan. Um, but more than a plan, you know, a tool for measuring progress and cost overruns and, you know, completion. Agreed, that's not easy to get. And they may have it. I mean, I know so on my other I, work, you know, I've seen such plans. So the just, way I was able to reference this is because there is available the CIP project summary, how much every project has been funded um, to date. And, and that's, it. it is tedious, but this would fall under public works. Yeah, public works has this and one of the one of the frustrations we had also was in trying to actually get an opportunity to talk with these various department heads which haven't haven't communicated with us because of covid okay other um suggestions under goal for other places where you think there should be something that's not there or ways we can contribute Oh, Ezra. Ezra, do you have your hand up? No, oh, sorry, I'm slow on the lowering hand. There we oh, go. Okay. Um, I know there's so much more we can do and just in the interest of time and kind of moving through this, I realize we can't get to every everything we might want to add, but, oh. Oh, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause for just a moment and before we continue through the document, even though I could go through the whole thing, but um, first, but I, I want to take public comment because I also am, apparently there's no, apparently there are no instructions in the agenda on how public comment will be handled, but that actually, it is there. So let me read it. Maybe it's not jumping out. Let me just read the instructions on the agenda. My pages. 
recorder here. Oops. Sorry, if anybody, oh, here we go. Um, public comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Elena, I've got my, oh, here we, here we go. Remote public comment. Um, oh, I see. So if you're attending the meeting, the meeting, you can only apparently attend the meeting if you use text messaging, the web link isn't working. Um, I'm a little confused here by these messages. There are no instructions in the agenda on how public comment. So public comment can either be emailed to fbc at cityofdavis.org or if, I'm, a little con I'm sorry, I'm a little confused by this, but if the person is called in, they would be on the phone. Uh, Donna, when people are on the phone, they can do a star nine. Okay. Um, so, um, and if they're on Zoom, they just need to raise hand. Um, at the moment, I do not see anybody who's calling into the meeting. We do have somebody who has a raised hand um, in the public right now. Oh, okay. Um, so if you do would like to hear them speak. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Please go ahead. And maybe that's who this is trying to make public comment. So, and then we'll continue with where we were. Okay. Hold on a second, and we have Matt Williams, um, who would like to speak. So hold on a second. Matt, can you hear us? You can unmute. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So if you need to speak, this is your opportunity. Please go ahead. Um, two things, uh, both f fall under the realm of holistic. When I I've, I've wrestled with these goals and objectives for years um, in your role and, and as a citizen. And I, I concur with your, the points that Donna and others have made that, you know, the, 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 it's very hard to understand a lot of these without the context. But even more importantly, what we have here are a set of goals and objectives in an environment in which the city has no vision. There, if you go to the general plan, there are 35 different statements that are given the label of vision, but they are, they are really not a vision. We, uh, what is the vision for Davis? Is Davis a, um, a bedroom community where the vast majority of people who work and live in Davis have their jobs outside the city limits. Um, when we look at objective two of, of goal number two, economic development, what is the context? What's the vision where we're trying to do these granular goals and objectives? So if I were in the Finance and Budget Commission still, uh, I would be strongly advising the, the, the city council that the city needs to establish, do a process to establish what is the vision for the future of Davis. Um, I would argue that the reason that the DISC proposal, the biggest reason that the DISC proposal failed was because it had no context. It's, it, was, it, was, it stood out by itself and you couldn't understand how it was part of an overall plan. The same thing is true when you look at the individual goals in revenue. The very first one talks about one particular um, rate study. Well, the Utilities Commission is actually in the process of four different rate studies. And one of the things that's been become very clear is that if we are going to be thinking in the in the in the eyes of our ratepayers. They don't care about an indiv each individual rate. The city may do that because fiscally that makes a difference. But what they really are looking at is the holistic view of the entire utility bill. So one of the things that utility commission is doing is looking at rate balancing amongst all of the utilities so that there is predictable rates for the combination of all of the uh, utilities and predictable revenue for each of the individual utilities from the city's position. So I would recommend strongly if I were in the Finance and Budget Commission to say, 
that that kind of rate balancing should be done and that finance and budget would come back a year from now and look at whether or not after rate balancing has been done and the four studies are completed, whether or not there are funds that can be used in other ways. I could go on, but having a vision that other than the de facto vision of Davis is a bedroom community where there are not where most people do not work within the city limits of Davis. And even the people who work in the city of limits of Davis, most of them are part-time employees. We need to have a vision that we agree to, then we can build some of these goals and objectives on that vision and people Thanks. will understand it and be able to move forward on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Um, so I'm going to pick back up where we were at. We were under goal four, and I just want to kind of to move along a little bit here. I know this is a long document. Are there some thoughts in item four? And again, this is really the focus is on the actual maintenance and, fun and, and on the funding and improvement of infrastructure. These are all obviously areas where we could add analysis and review, but in terms of whether there's something missing here, Not seeing any hands, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move us to objective two. Um, on page twelve, can I go? Gerkern and I, in the context of the next budget item, Gerkern pointed out that there is a way to raise revenue for something very specific for firefighting, which is a big expenditure of the city, by imposing a special kind of parcel tax that takes into account the risk that a taller building might have. So you would have a stream of revenue that could allow you perhaps to hire more firefighters, to buy more equipment, to maintain what you've got. Um, so uh, that was a, Gurkern found out another community, I've forgotten which one, came up with that. Uh, but um, I wonder if there are other ways that other communities have imposed special taxes that would be helpful to the city. Um, I don't see a lot. Uh, I guess the word tax may be, forgid, uh, may be forbidden from this kind of document, but um, well, it isn't. But um, People don't like to talk about taxes, but one way is to have selective taxes that really put the burden on the kinds of structures or activities that uh, require additional revenue. And I don't see that anywhere in this document ex exactly, but maybe somebody can correct me on that. Let me also really quickly support um, what Paul was referencing. It was the city of Orinda. It's called a fire flow tax. This was referenced by FEMA and the United States government as being a source of, of fire and EMS um, revenue. Uh, and basically, if you're, if you're planning on building taller buildings, it doesn't make sense that you would have a disproportionate tax um, to support this, uh, support this fire protection. So it is... A, a parcel tax specific to your fire risk. Um, that's about it. Okay, thanks. So I, I think that that's uh, the whole thing about fair taxes are on um, goal one, objective one. So maybe we could put it there or suggest it go there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move down um, bottom of 12, objective two, providing a safe and efficient circulation system. I'm, you know, uh, there's some places for us to do some analysis in here. I mean, that's, those are pretty evident under C, for example, but is there anything that's really missing here? And again, this really is a primarily more of a land use issue, more of a, you know, planning commission type issue. Oh, I got two hands up, Ezra and Paula, Ezra. Oh, but again, just no, kind of- I'm sorry. Go ahead, okay. Paul. I'm taking my I'm taking mine down too. Okay, good, good, good. Because that's sort of outside of our 
Um, so objective three, addressing long-term maintenance and funding needs for parks, open spaces. There's some um, uh, identify sustainable funding sources for the urban forest budget. The city's work got a grant for that. Uh, let's see, I wanna keep going here a little bit. I don't think under 3A there's too much for us. Um, under objective four, uh, is there's something I wanna make sure to catch it. No, 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 I don't see anything under four either. Not seeing it. That's more land use. But, um, but with the sports complex and the aquatic center, those where, things. Where have, are you, Paul? Paul, where, where are you? Is that, that's objective three, or am I in the wrong section? Oh, yeah. So you're back on three. Okay. Go back. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. looked at those in the past. Um, we, they've been previewed, and we've some of them have been promised they would come back as they moved along. And I think we definitely have a role in at least looking over the shoulder of the consultant reports. Oh, and where are you? Can you help me find where you are? I'm sorry, um, I'm on goal five, or is that not where yeah, we no, are? That, that's okay, I thought you were going back. So you're on goal, goal five. Goal five, objective okay. three. Oh, okay. On the sports gotcha. park, park economic analysis. That's okay. just a natural for us to look at. And we have looked at it uh, I don't know if we looked at the sports complex, but they did present the aquatics plan mm -hmm. to us at one point. And uh, it seems to me that's perfectly appropriate. We, we have a lot of people who keep their pencils sharp and their calculators handy and are, can chip in and, and uh, challenge assumptions or uh, do uh, recalculate uh, uh, I, I just think it's, this is something where we would have a role very naturally. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm missing something that I thought was in here. I'm, um, I'm gonna keep moving if I don't see hands raised because we're kind of getting, uh, so on 16, Reducing the number of individuals who are homeless. Develop, I mean, there's a lot of work going on in the Social Services Commission um, related to issues around homelessness. Um, those issues. I'm gonna. I'm gonna kind of move us through that to. So page 17. Um, I'm missing, I'm missing some, I must have skipped something that I wanted to, ah, I'm going to keep moving though if there aren't comments on them. Um, page 18, objective four, provide visible and sufficient public safety services throughout the community. Um, a lot of these are things that are more within the Police Accountability Commission. Um, Page 19, there is some analysis uh, on L, performing a cost, oh, the, the, so that analysis has already been performed, so let's stop that one, okay. So moving to the bottom of page 19, and again, the, the, some of those public safety issues on stat, those are more focused on strategies for policing and not so much on financial issues, so I'm, I'm going to move ahead to 20, objective six. Um, any suggestions? Um, not seeing any. Okay. Um, page 21, objective seven, um, using the five E's to improve traffic safety, again, more traffic issues, not so financial. One of the things that metric, uh, that, that Ezra and others have brought up is the whole notion of measurement of metrics mm -hmm. or what, and, and I think that comes in in terms of uh, a lot of public safety objectives and 
um, a variety of things. I mean, well-being, the community well-being. The, I think the feeling has long been of the commission and, and Ezra has brought this up multiple times that there ought to be measurable outcomes when we have a new initiative or not just completing a project, but looking at what the purpose of the project is and coming up with some sort of metrics about how su successful that expenditure actually has been. Mm -hmm. So uh, in policing, you might say, we're gonna change our policing strategy. It doesn't seem, you ought to have a metric if you're gonna extend, use resources to change uh, how you do things, should you have a metric to measure whether you've accomplished that? Mm -hmm. And it seems to, and these are tricky and subtle, but uh, I, this commission has a lot of expertise in business and this kind of thing is done all the time. And, and it, I don't, Again, this is sort of more global than any on any specific item, but I think it's worth mm -hmm. thinking about. Sure, no, excellent point. I'm gonna move us to goal six and kind of see if we can push through the remainder of this really quickly. Um, under goal six, are there some suggestions, areas, David? Just to follow up on Paul's comment, having some, some metrics. so. The way I, I see these the, this this list, there's over a hundred different ideas. The vast majority of them fall into the category of planning, doing an assessment, a strategy document, and all those are, are good things to be up to a point. But where you can really do the metrics is when you have a physical improvement, and to the extent there's a focus on that that's easier to show that we that something was actually accomplished. So on page 24, you have a good examples. You have things that um, were um, concrete, uh, complete third street gateway, and then complete two public restrooms. Both are those completed. So just another general observation, the more you have more that we can focus on as, as a city on things that can make a concrete improvement, the more likely we're gonna get an outcome like that. The strategy documents, the assessments, there's a lot of those that are going on. So maybe that's another part of the conversation. How do you prioritize those? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's my metric. If you, have, if you have something more concrete, it's easier to evaluate. If we wanted to do something for these completed projects, we could review them as a commission and see if they delivered the goods as promised. They probably mm -hmm. did, but it doesn't hurt to have somebody take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a great example of uh, identify intersections where uh, the most accidents are, and then come up with a plan to to ameliorate the problem. And then you could, in theory, you could measure uh, what the your outcome. Have you successfully changed what what's happening at these intersections? Have they has the traffic have the have the accidents actually gone down? There's some really great ideas in this document, and it would be nice to see how they play out. Right. So I have to ask um, Council Member Carson, do you guys have like an all day meeting plan for this? Is that the plan? I think it will be several hours uh, mm -hmm. with this being the virtually so focus of the meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, which was sufficient um, since we're going to war game a lot of ideas, I'm sure do some ranking and things like that, but then we have another whole meeting after that uh, March 23 meeting to right. reach further decisions. Yeah. And we will be receiving public comment on March 23. Yeah. Right. So, so just to kind of run through the rest of the document and, and just so you all know, I mean, there've been a lot of great suggestions. These are really very good ideas. And after the meeting, I mean, they're not things that we necessarily, I think have to vote on unless there's a desire to do that. But after the meeting, I'm gonna go through and listen again to the tape and really just make, list all of the points that we've made, try to make them coherent and give a little context around them for city council and I'll, you know, Sub submit that in writing to council. 
So, um, and, I, and I realize, as, as Elena said earlier, you may have individual comments you want to add as well, because for us to go through all of this in, in just as one of our agenda items tonight, it's, it's pretty difficult to really make any progress and do anything that meaningful. Are, um, are, we, are we allowed to send, I sent you something, uh, sort of a, a summary of all my thoughts on this document and can you use that in, in, yeah. as input, even though we didn't discuss it publicly? I, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just send it to me, and that's fine. And and Elena's sharing it now. And I, I don't want us to kind of go through each item in it. I mean, it's very helpful. We had a lot of great points. Um, and Elena's going to post it to the agenda as well as an additional attachment. And a lot of them are things we have we have talked about. I think we've touched on many of them. Um, so. But I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of move us a little bit forward here. So um, under goal six, does anyone have any um, thing they want to add? Any way where through goal six? And it's a pretty long goal. I'm not seeing any hands up at the moment. Oh no, okay. Uh, no goal seven. And some of these we've already touched on, you know, this idea of measuring our, how well we deliver services. We've talked about that in a number of places. Um, the, the last goal, um, to be honest with you, I don't know, I don't know if we want to discuss it or not. It's more about the internal workplace dy dynamics. Um, I don't feel that I have um, a lot to add. I'm not sure it's really our role to manage the internal workings of the staff. Um, there is one item that I know Paul would be interested in, this idea of completing a citywide classification study. I think that's something where we could add some analysis to that because classification studies are really, really important. Those describe the positions in city government and the salary ranges and the duties. And um, it's a really interesting area in local government these days. And I think we could add to the fiscal analysis on that. And the other thoughts on eight, objective eight. So I'm not seeing any further. So um, I'm going to go through, and I, I'm not able to restate every single point right now that was just made. I've written many of them down, and the rest I'll go through the tape and listen to. And I will put together a summary of the points we made for the council and um, we'll provide it in writing to them. Um, these are all super helpful, great points. Um, and obviously you're all free to um, you know, submit your own individual comments as well if you want. Unfortunately, I can't, we can't outside of this meeting, I can't send you my summary and have us all discuss it outside of this meeting. Um, I just have to, you know, do a synopsis based on what we've discussed here. Is there anything that someone suggested that people feel really shouldn't be in our recommendations? I got the sense there was general sort of uniformity around things. Okay. Okay. So, so with that, we can move on from this item to our next item of business tonight, which is our review of the city staff's analysis related to the proposed purchase of the fire ladder truck. And I thank you for those of you who are able to kind of consolidate some comments prior to the meeting. It's gonna make this really useful. Um, so we're not trying to put together um, seven sets of comments. Um, before we get into the item, I just wanna call for public comment on this item. Donna, are you calling for a public comment on um, the fire ladder truck or on the prior yes. one? Okay. Fire and ladder truck. Yes, we already had public comment on the other one. Yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone would like to speak on the fire ladder truck, um, if you're on the phone, please press star nine. If you're on Zoom, please raise your hand. 
And I see nobody wanting to speak at the moment. Donna? Great, thank you. So um, I sent, as you all saw, I sent out an email because we, we got this analysis on Friday and I suggested that perhaps some subcommittees, if they had the ability, could form and consolidate comments. So Ezra and Doug and I did do a consolidation of ours, which I can share with you. And then um, Paul and Gakern were able to consolidate theirs, which are attached to the agenda. And Ray and David, I don't know if you had the opportunity to do that. Ray, you have your hand up. I have just two questions, actually three questions. The first is, I think, uh, Gurkern and Paul did an excellent job and echo almost all the questions I would have. The three additional ones are firstly, what unique capabilities does the squad truck have that an engine or ladder would not? Is a part of the proposal is to replace the squad with the ladder truck. The second is, how often has the squad truck made use of its unique capabilities? And then the third is, doesn't the National Fire Protection Act require both sprinklers and standpipes in the types of buildings that the ladder truck would service, thus making the need for the apparatus questionable? You guys that's are like, all I have. Thank you. That's super helpful. I had no idea that you guys were so knowledgeable about fire equipment. So just to give you a little background here. So yes, Paul and Kakern did a great job with a summary of their comments and questions. And then Doug and Ezra and I combined ours. And the two points that you've just made are in our summary document. No thanks to me, but um, Doug actually made both of the points you just stated here. So what we could do, and this may be a really easy, efficient way to kind of handle this, Paul and Kern's analysis doesn't conflict in any way with the, the one that Doug and Ezra and I did, and I can share that with you now, and maybe what we decide we want to do as a commission, David, I want to know if you have other comments too, but we may just combine the two documents or just attach them and provide them to city, to the city staff and city council. Um, so, David, do you have any comments you want to offer? Well, I, I do. Um, I didn't see these other uh, documents, so I, I'm at the risk of, of uh, repeating something that was already said. I'm trying to scan them now a little bit. I didn't realize they were coming in. Um, so I do have comments. I could, I could give them real quickly, but they, they may have already been given. And that's fine. So what happened was, you know, we were sort of juggling the Brown Act and other things. And so the analysis that Paul and Gakern worked up, that was sent to Elena and she attached it to the agenda today. The document that Doug and Ezra and I did, we, we didn't send around to you and we need to, sh we should share it now because you're right, you haven't seen it um, just because we had very limited time and we got it together today. Um, but we can share that now. It, um, and I don't know, maybe Elena, if it makes sense, does it make sense for us to share that document now for people to take a look at it? Um, you can, but I did want to mention that we do have a fire chief who uh, was prepared to make a presentation on this item. And I wanted to ask if we are oh. prepared actually to hear the presentation. Oh. Or oh. if you decide not to have. Oh, I hadn't, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that he was thinking of doing a presentation because um, he had done one for council. Um, uh, what? Is it, how, how long is the presentation and is it different from what was presented to council? Well, this is actually, this particular presentation is more focused, I think, on the costing. You've obviously seen the staff report. He was just, uh, having some additional information in terms of uh, hopefully maybe based on the questions that were provided. So okay. um, it's up to you. Okay, so let's do this just in the, because we're, okay, I hadn't realized that. So let's do this. Can we share 
the document that Doug and Ezra and I put together and um, give people just a chance to kind of glance through it. And Doug, you may want to speak through it just a little bit too, since you did a fair bit of the writing. And then, um, and then we would certainly like to hear from the fire chief, of course, since he's here. Um, and then, especially if we can focus more on questions that we might have. So- Sure, and um, Donna, if you can provide the, uh, the document that you have, I only have the one that Paul yeah, has. I know. So and Quickly. If you email it to me, I will be able to get it. I am just about to do that. I'm going to get in there. And okay. And while we're waiting, I have one general comment. I was really struck, and probably you all were, that the idea of getting this new truck sounds great, right? You get a uh, hopefully the grant would cover the cost of the equipment, pay for some of the added staff, at least for the first few years. Sounds like a great deal. But then you start looking at all the ramifications and you need a new fire station or at least to remodel an old one. And I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that the economic implications of getting a grant can often go way beyond uh, what seems like in a way a freebie. They're, these are not free. You have to staff them. You have to, uh, you have to plan for, the new, for a new facility and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a much bigger deal um, than just adding a truck. So Elena is sharing the analysis, and, and Doug, I don't know if you want to do a quick kind of summary or recap. You had some really great points in here. Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I guess uh, I'll just I'll just go through these points, and then um, your idea, Don, is that Chief Kenny can then kind of like incorporate responses into his presentation. Is that right? That'd be great if possible. You know, the more he can answer. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. Um, good evening, Chief Kenny. And can I ask you, is, is that the appropriate way to address you? I, I've, uh, I'm an ex-Navy guy, and I, I just want to make sure I'm using the right. Yeah, absolutely. That, that works just fine. Okay. Um, all right, well, anyway, thank you for your, uh, you know, the uh, presentation you made to council back uh, in November, I think it was, and and uh, the information we got in the staff report. Having said that, ha having read the material that we had um, um, access to, um, I did not, it was not clear to me that we've established or that you've established that there's a need for a new ladder truck. And um, there was a report referenced in the staff report uh, that we did not have access to, but um, I can't remember the name of the company right now, but. I think uh, you stated that this third party consultant had um, concluded that, or they recommended that the city acquire a ladder truck. Um, so at any rate, I, we did not have access to that report. And again, from where I sit, it's the, the need has not been established. And I think several of us on this commission, uh, you know, feel the same way. Um, there's a couple of um, uh, points about that. Um, one that we'd like to know is right now, I think that the UC Davis ladder truck responds to Davis emergencies that require a ladder truck. And one of the questions that's been asked is how many times has that ladder truck been needed to respond to um, fires and or to situations in the city of Davis that specifically require that equipment? And um, that's one of the overall questions. Okay, the second point here is that tall buildings and current building code. And um, my understanding is that all tall buildings, like, like one of the points was made that um, in, in the um, staff report that there's a lot of newer buildings being built that are taller, that are up to seven stories tall. Um, and um, my knowledge of building code is that those buildings are all sprinklered and that they have um, standpipes inside of the buildings on every floor uh, for fire equipment to attach to. So, um, you know, another observation is that, you know, we've got 
tall buildings that are much taller than seven building uh, seven stories, all in every city throughout the world that cannot be reached by by um, fire trucks. And those fires are typically fought, in my understanding, is by firefighters walking up the stairs and then connecting to firefighting equipment in the stairwell and fighting those fires. So um, that's just another point uh, um, that we'd like some understanding of. Um, as I mentioned, the alternatives and the UCD resources. Um, the the uh, the other issue down here is ongoing and staffing costs. And this is what really I think gets problematic um, for me and some of the other people I discussed this with, which is that um, we're talking about significant long-term ongoing costs. And um, the grant that you referenced in your um, staff report, my understanding covers the first three years of these salaries. Um, but after that, the city's on the hook, and we're already in a situation where we have, um, you know, uh, scarce resources that we're trying to allocate. And that leads to the last point, which is the potential alternatives. This is not, really not, not a question for you, Chief Tenney, it's for, for other members of the commission and for the city council. But, you know, we have significant, significant um, uh, uh, sh sh issues in the city uh, that we need to allocate resources to. Just name two of them. One is homelessness, and that's something that we all see every day if you drive anywhere in, in town. And another one is our infrastructure and our and our roads issues. Um, so again, we're really trying to allocate very scarce resources to certain needs. And from my perspective. Ultimately, um, we haven't really established that this is really a clear and present need, this ladder truck in the city. So with that, I, I think I'd, I'd turn it over to you, back to Donna or, or Chief Tang. Um, Donna, I would strongly recommend that um, the Chief has an opportunity to give his presentation because I do believe some of those questions would be answered. So Yeah, that's what um, we're doing, Elena. That's what we're doing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. We're very thankful that he's here. And that was our plan. So, okay. yeah, Chief, so Chief would, Tenney, if you'd like to go ahead, please go ahead. Thank you for coming here tonight. We appreciate your time. All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, good evening to all of you. It's, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to um, talk to everybody and hopefully answer your questions. And I think uh, the presentation will provide a lot of those answers and some background, maybe some foundation. Um, and so let me start by making sure I can share screen here. <clears throat> okay, I think we'll, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so again, thank you for uh, being here. We have presented to council back in November and some of these slides were taken from that presentation because I think it, they were good to kind of, again, build that foundation. And with council, the direction that we were given uh, uh, from council was to come back with a cost analysis. And you know there hasn't been approval for the, the truck at this point, but this is uh, the task that they've given us to come back with this cost analysis. Um, I'll include in this presentation, some of the uh, emergency operations and what a truck is for. And uh, hopefully that'll answer a lot of these questions that has been presented. Um, but in that cost analysis, we're looking at uh, the ladder truck acquisition cost, uh, the staffing options and costs that some of you referred to, the operations and maintenance estimates that we have for that, and then also some estimates for the fire station modifications. Um, to help give a little bit of a background um, for the Davis Fire Department, just to, on the incidents where we um, have been, um, in 2019, we actually ran a little over 6,200 calls for service uh, emergency responses. Um, in 2020, in a rare circumstance, usually those calls go up between five and 10% or more every year. Uh, but uh, because most likely of COVID and some of the data we're gathering, we actually went down a little bit for incidents over this last year. Uh, one of the key points um, is of the three stations we have, the downtown station is the busiest and it 
it serves over 52% of the calls uh, approximately. And during that time, we often get what's referred to as simultaneous calls, meaning the engine's already left on a call and there's another call nearby in the same jurisdiction. Um, and we've had 574 of those uh, in the year 2020. The squad, which is the other unit stationed downtown, isn't a full company. It's only two people on it. It's more of a supplement. And the squad responses last year were 832 times during the year that it responded and was used. Um, and then just for reference, the UCD truck came over to the city from their jurisdiction. They actually operate from a different dispatch center on different radio channels. They're a completely separate jurisdiction, uh, but their truck came over to serve the city on auto aid 115 times. Um, this little graph here is just a kind of an interesting one uh, for all of you on this is represents the squad responses that 832 times but you'll see that right in March, there's about two or three months there where it just fell off of the squad responses. Uh, not sure exactly why that occurred that way, um, but the squad responds to all of the vehicle accident because it has special tools on it like a truck would um, where we do our auto extrication. So every vehicle accident that occurs within the city's jurisdiction, we have Interstate 80 and 113 that are, particularly on 80, we have a lot of vehicle accidents. Um, I, think, I don't think anybody was on the road <laughs> during that time. And so that might partially explain this, but I thought it was interesting that this uh, graph showed the steep decline in the incidents for the squad. <clears throat> Brief history on the growth of the Davis Fire Department over the last uh, 36 years is, for 1985 was the last time a, a station was added to the Davis Fire Department. Um, and at that time, um, there, the city responded to about a thousand calls of service. Um, and like I said before, this last year, last two years, we're running about 6,000 calls now. So a substantial increase. Also, it's, it's on a side note, uh, in 1985, when they added that fire station, the minimum staffing on a daily basis was 10 to serve those three stations, 10 firefighters each day. Today, our minimum staffing is 11. Um, in 1999, they actually upgraded due to a OSHA new requirement for firefighters when they fight uh, structure fires and go into a dangerous respiratory environment. Um, the city decided to upgrade the staffing on the engines to four so that they would have the ability for every two firefighters that go into fire fire, not every two, but the initial two, OSHA requires that there's two firefighters just to fire, just to rescue firefighters that might get in trouble. It's called the two out, uh, two in, two out rule. Um, that was passed in 98 and the city decided to add the, to the engine companies. But in 2008, um, during the recession, we lost that ability and went back down to the three-person engine companies per day, and we lost basically nine firefighter positions. There's been no increases in those resources until um, 2019, where we added three firefighters uh, specifically for relief staffing because the amount of overtime we were really a lot of money has been spent on overtime and our firefighters were getting worked to death. They were being forced to work, especially in the wildland season, the summer months, uh, many days in a row. And so um, council approved the three additional firefighters, which had a huge impact, not just overtime, but just the morale and the um, people being able to have days off vacation and um, our ability to respond to these greater disasters. <clears throat> Uh, basically, uh, the document you referenced earlier is called a standards of cover document uh, and that was done, in, it was completed in 2018 under uh, Chief Arbuthnot when he was here. And the standards of cover is an in-depth document that reviews a lot of different um, aspects of the fire department and where their needs might lie. Excuse me. Uh, the next document that we're looking before COVID hit was establishing when I got promoted a um, strategic plan, five-year strategic plan for the fire department. So <clears throat> we're looking at that, but basically our critical resource needs for the fire department at this time are these five items. Um, and that is the number one is that area ladder truck. And I'll get in a little bit more why as we go through a couple of slides. Um, but the acquisition of a tillered ladder truck is, is very important. 
Um, we desperately, we don't have any admin staff except myself and one administrative aide at this point to run our prevention office, you know, records keeping, our operations, our training department. So we're really hurting for um, administrative staff. One of those would be a dedicated 40 hour training chief who's not on shift and trying to, to respond to emergencies, but he's there to make sure that we're getting the training that supports our emergency response. And there's a lot of mandated training year round. There's, there's ongoing training that we have to do. Um, a lot of discussion was uh, held earlier about a replacement fire station 31. It was built in 1965 and it has kind of run its course in just about every category. And so it is something that's been on the radar to some degree, um, hoping uh, once we get through these other two items to really focus on how we can accomplish that because it really it needs attention and we need to have a plan to, to replace these fire stations. Uh, I talked about additional administrative staff and then lastly it's really rare that a city municipal fire department like ours doesn't have a place to do their training. Over the years we've done it at you know areas that were under construction where there weren't a lot of people um, they're basically public roadways and areas that we would try to go to. Um, if we needed higher building training, we'd go down to first and F and use the parking structure, which is obviously problematic if you're dropping hose and you need to, you need better training. So again, a training facility is another uh, crit critical resource need in the future. Um, so specifically the truck, I think <clears throat> these are a few of the things that the truck, you know, provides to the Davis Fire Department and it's very important to understand that the ladder truck is not about just about the large ladder, the hundred foot area ladder that sits on top of it. It's not just about the tall buildings. In fact, that's only a fraction of what that is, its uses are. Um, it's important, um, but the truck actually has multiple uses and it's a specialized piece of equipment. Um, earlier, I talked about simultaneous calls and by adding the fourth company, so to speak, to the downtown station, it becomes available for most all other calls, additional calls that may come in. Um, it's just more resources, fire resources that are available within the city. Um, it also, with the additional staffing, helps us during those summer months, like last summer, where we were just overwhelmed with wildland fire season and the ability to go assist the state or local counties, even our own county had a major incident with the uh, um, fires over in Winters and Vacaville that we were heavily involved in. But those extra people, not just staff the truck, but they make off-duty people available to go on these deployments throughout the state that all fire departments do. We do talk about, you understand the multi-story access. Currently our engines only have two ladders on them. There are 24 foot extension ladder and a 14 foot roof ladder, which is a standard um, set by NFPA. Uh, the ladder truck not only has the large ladder on the top, but it has a complement of several ground ladders that gives us the ability. The engine's ladders can only reach the roof of a second floor. And so um, somebody mentioned it earlier and it's mentioned here that we do have existing three-story buildings in the city, uh, over 217 buildings basically, um, that are just three-story that exist already today. And so the need for that equipment and those ground ladders and the aerial ladder is important to the city of Davis. Um, and then also mentioned was the new construction. Uh, a lot of the buildings going in now that have been completed, the hotels that are in place, and then also a good example is um, the Fifth Street, um, uh, facility, uh, you know, housing. And then there's another, another one nearing completion on Olive that are five stories. And so um, it's not just about getting to the window, but it's often getting to the roof of structures so that the firefighters can do the ventilation and stuff on the building when there is a fire. Um, but again, it's really important to understand that the, the aerial ladder truck is like a big toolbox. Um, it doesn't actually even carry any water, but it carries specialized tools and equipment. Um, and it has special rescue abilities. You can see in some of the pictures, some of the things. Um, our squad carries the uh, emergency cutters and spreaders for vehicle extrication. Uh, but that would be transferred onto the truck and the squad would be taken out of service and that equipment would be used uh, to respond to all the vehicle accidents. 
which is pretty much the industry norm. Um, on this list here on this slide, it just shows again, the various things that this ladder truck carries and it assists in um, uh, a lot of different things. We've had, if you see the one picture there with the Long Beach uh, Fire Department, we've had a few rescues off the causeway where we've had to use either the, the West Sacramento truck is the one that was used uh, to do pretty much exactly what you see there, which is to send people over the side, get the victims and bring them back up over the, over the side, especially in winter times when we can't get access down there. Um, so all, all of this tools and equipment is specialized and the ladder truck is used for kind of specific things on most structure fires, even residential fires. Again, it's not about the, the ladder on the top, it's about the work that those people are doing, whether it's search or ventilation um, or a forceful entry to gain access to certain places. They have a specific job that they do. So getting into some of the costing, which is really what the council is, uh, all the slides before was just kind of trying to give you a foundation of what the ladder truck's really about. Um, but <clears throat> getting into the kind of the funding, we do have um, public safety development impact fees, uh, a fund that's available to public safety to be used and needs to be used for things like this. Um, and so the purchase of the ladder truck, it's being looked into to, to use those funds to actually, um, um, for the purchase, the one-time uh, cost of that. You talked about staffing. Uh, as you do that, there's the general fund. Most of the other things would come out of the general fund, except we, we are applying and looking at all the possible grants, not only for the truck, but for some other equipment for the fire department. But specifically, the FEMA Safer Grant is specifically for um, personnel. And somebody earlier had mentioned that, that yes, it does pay for the three years. And they upgraded that just this year to that three years, 100% of the new personnel that the Safer Grant does um, provide. Um, and then we've also are applying for the uh, Assistant for Firefighters Grant, which is also FEMA for the equipment portion of that, that $300,000. Um, because it's the first truck, there is some equipment that is transferred from the squad to the truck. But um, being the first truck, there's an amount of equipment that we're going to need to purchase to um, outfit it the first go around. Uh, of course, uh, the grants are not a guarantee. And so regardless of whether we get the grants or not, it's, it's going to be very important that the Davis Fire Department can get the truck. Now, one of the big questions is the staffing. <clears throat> this slide here, I really wanted to, to help understand and paint a picture as to NFPA, National Fire Protection Agency provides, it's a library of information, of guidelines and recommendations um, for the fire service in just about everything. In Yolo County, including Davis, uh, on that first alarm or initial alarm response to a fire, a basic family residence, the goal is to get 17 personnel firefighters there within a time period, a specific time period that they state on the initial response. <clears throat> as soon as you go to a multifamily housing, apartments, larger building, commercial size structure, and specifically a high rise, that immediately changes uh, for like apartments, it's noted there 28 personnel is what they say is recommended. And for a high rise, it's 42 personnel on the initial alarm. Yolo County does not have that capability. Um, most of Yolo County, if not all of it, like the slide I show you with the history, we have not been increasing our fire resources for 20 years and it's catching up to us. Uh, we're getting real busy with call volumes, more people, and then specifically the things we have to deal with uh, statewide as we help each other out. We've depended on this automatic and mutual aid from each other for a long time, and it's, um, it's definitely starting to have an effect on our resources locally. So one of the positive is, is by staffing the truck, the costs we're gonna save, uh, the current squad has six personnel, two per shift. So that immediately, those personnel will be transferred to the truck. And so we already have that in place. It's already being paid for. The new firefighters that would be needed to, for an ideal situation to have a four person minimum staff truck would be six additional personnel um, for a total of 12. 
uh, what can be done is you can have three peer three people on the minimum staffing, which only requires nine, which only require three additional firefighters. Um, this is a breakdown of the costs of the staffing. Um, and then also the uh, operation and maintenance costs. costs. Uh, for a four person, you'll see the numbers there. Some of this was available in the staff report. Um, the annual operation maintenance cost is the same regardless of how many people you put on it. Uh, the staffing costs are obviously quite a bit different. Uh, and this does not include any of the grant funding. Grant funding would significantly reduce this for three years. Um, and then the one-time purchase is about the same because it's the same amount of equipment. The only thing that changes there slightly is the amount of personal protective gear we have to buy for the extra staff that we're, we're bringing on board. So Yolo County, across the county, we have basically three jurisdictions that have their own truck companies. West Sacramento has a minimum staff of four people on their truck. Um, the city of Woodland, they last year before COVID hit, they had hired three additional firefighters to go to a four person minimum staffing daily on their truck. But when COVID hit, they, changed, they, they put the brakes on that. They kept the three firefighters, but they applied them to COVID relief staffing as people had to be quarantined and things had to change. Um, talking to the chief there, they will be going back to the four person staffing before 2022. And then UC Davis, similarly hired three firefighters to bring their staffing to four, but they're gonna maintain a minimum of three, which is always another option. You can you know, try to have four, but as people have um, vacation, sick leave, uh, injury leave, and those kinds of things, uh, you gotta have relief staffing. Um, you can always say we, we hire for four, but we only minimum staff it with three. And so understand the re another thing behind uh, these truck companies and frankly also engine companies and all of the resources available in the county, water tenders, all the fire departments have you know, a certain amount of resources. We share those resources. Um, and that will always be needed. This mutual and automatic aid, um, you know, just the other day on Friday, uh, we had a small fire downtown uh, where the UC truck did come in and, and threw their ladder downtown. But then later in the day, uh, the city of Woodland had a uh, second alarm commercial structure fire that required mo half the resources immediately out of Davis to go help and assist that. Uh, at, at the very time they got the second alarm or upgrade to the second alarm commercial fire, um, they got another residential fire, fully involved kitchen. So now they've got units from Woodland, um, West Sac uh, not just Woodland, but West Sacramento, you, all of the UC Davis units left town immediately and were gone. Um, we brought units in from Dixon. Uh, our Davis units went down to a point where we had one engine and we were having Dixon come over to help cover us. The point of all this is basically to understand that the fire service today in California is challenged with a limited amount of resources. Our responsibility is to first the city of Davis. And as we have the need to add more resources with staffing and equipment, um, we can't keep relying on other jurisdictions for our community. That is getting harder and harder to do. In fact, when we often have a, a fire in Davis, all the units go to that. And then we ask the other cities for a unit, you know, two additional units just to cover the additional medicals and other fires that may occur that's getting harder and harder. They're not available because they don't have them. All of us are, are behind the curve on um, this resource allocation. And it's become quite challenging actually. <clears throat> uh, so just in closing, the last slide here is just basically what I was just saying is that things in California are changing. Over the last seven years, we've seen the disasters, the unimaginable things that continue to occur um, that triggers resource allocation and we're all helping each other because it may come a time when Davis needs that help and we we call for mutual and automatic aid. That will always be there. But again, our focus needs to be on our own Davis community, the things we could control, um, me as the fire chief, the training and all the things that go into protecting our citizens here um, will play a role. And also the fact that having that truck an additional truck, when you have the UC Davis campus as large as it, is, as it is, as many people as it has, those buildings are large. Um, most of those would take two trucks on the initial alarm. 
and they only have the one truck and one engine to cover their jurisdiction. And they often go on mutual aid to cover and help out other jurisdictions. So this was, to me was the, the number one priority in my strategic plan. And that's why it's been um, so important. Um, some, oftentimes the other jurisdictions, like right now, I just got word today that the city of Dixon, they have a cross staff truck that we often can share also. It's out of service until the end of April. It's just not available. And so these are the kind of the things that we have to kind of try to gauge and balance out. So um, that is it. That's the end of that presentation. Thank you, Thank you Chief Tenney. Um, commissioners, are there questions for the fire chief? Uh, go Kurt. Hello Chief Tenney, quick question. Um, so if additional firefighters were hired, three additional firefighters were hired right now, um, would they have space on existing engines and trucks to, to fulfill their roles? Uh, so if there were, are you in reference to the truck or just the existing engines now? Just the existing. Oh yeah, absolutely. We have the space, uh, for additional firefighters for sure. Gotcha. Okay. So regardless, the additional firefighters will provide relief and support yeah. for a, a number of these. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. David. Um, I, I'm going to assume we have a chance to uh, uh, make comments about this later. So I just, right now we're just focusing on questions for the chief, correct? Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you, chief, for your presentation that clarified some items for me. I just want to double check. So what is the status now with the three-story buildings in terms of the ability of the, the city to city fire to respond. And so what are we doing now? And what would we do differently with this aerial truck? And what would we do if when we get these five to seven story buildings, how, how would we respond to those now? And how would that be different with an aerial truck? So like I, it, it based on the incident need, um, depending on whether it's a three-story residential, which is kind of rare, but even with a two-story residential or a three-story commercial apartment complex and so forth, um, it depends on the incident's needs with that crew. And so they would use the ladders to gain access to do ventilation. That's one of the primary things that a truck company does on any fire, even if it's a single-story family residence, small structure. One of the first things they do is they coordinate their attack efforts with the engine company who pulls the hose into the house while they put a hole in, in the roof. So that at the same time, they let out all the heat and gases It makes it more attainable for anybody that might be stuck in there. And then also more, more attainable for and safer for the firefighters to go in and attack that fire. Um, pretty common, um, you know, three things we do right off the bat is we do the fire attack, we do a search for victims and we ventilate the structure. That's a key component of that. Right now, and to answer your question, the UC Davis truck responds on all of our first alarms as the truck. Um, we get their engine also, but again, they're, they're a separate jurisdiction. They may or may not be available. I can't, I have absolutely no control over anything that they do. Um, I'm relying on them to come help us. And my point was that we're having a more difficult time doing that. So, so the way I understand it then for 217 different structures in the city, um, in order to do the ideal uh, operation, you, the UC Davis truck has to be called. So you can do the ventilation for those three-story structures and our existing uh, fire services don't have that capability. Yeah, that's correct. So if the truck is out of town or helping another jurisdiction, we would have to call another truck from West Sacramento or Sacramento or Vacaville, which would take 15 to 30 minute response to do what needs to be done on the structure. The engines can't get higher than the second floor roof. Okay, and then for the, the five to seven stories that are um, in the planning or being constructed for those, is the UC Davis truck adequate for that or will that need uh, even a higher aerial ladder? No, so it, the point was made earlier that <clears throat> obviously in a 30 story building, uh, there's no ladders that will reach that. There is an amount of firefighting, a point at which you have to go inside the structure into the stairwells, but it still takes companies to gain access and to do the work and you know break windows. They, they still have specific jobs to do regardless of how many stories it is. Um, but Davis is made up of quite a few of these um, three-story or greater 
buildings that have attic spaces. Oftentimes these fires get into the attics and we need to cut holes in the roof and get access to the roof to be able to do some of this. Most of these kind of buildings, they don't have, if they're older buildings, they won't have the, the protection because the codes didn't require it back then. Um, or the code won't re require certain like sprinklers. Somebody mentioned that earlier. That's based upon a lot of factors, the occupancy of the building, um, the height of the building, a bunch of different things go into whether that's required or not. <clears throat> but <clears throat> that obviously isn't a guarantee either that there's no fires that happen in sprinkler buildings. Um, they, we still need a truck to go in with fans, break windows. They still have jobs to do. We still have to obtain the same objective, which is clear the smoke and heat and gases while the engine company is just trying to advance the hose lines to, to, to get the fire out. Um, but I understand the point. I get the point that, you know, there's, the ladder is 100 feet. It pretty much only goes to seven stories. You run into the same problem above that. But there's so much more that the truck company does every day. Um, yeah, my, 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 yeah, I was trying to just to see what the capacity was of that UC Davis truck. And, and it sounds like they're the go-to agency for mutual aid. And I know there's five-story buildings on campus, whether that truck can do what you would like to do for those five-story buildings, six-story yeah. buildings, seven-story. Does it have that height capacity? Is it, and if not, okay, that's another factor to consider in the decision-making. So yeah, the general, the general standard is about 100 feet, 100, 107 feet. And, you know, quite honestly, let's say, if you're familiar with the high-rise dorms, they're just off of Russell and LaRue. They're five stories. Um, they're, they're older dormitories that don't have sprinklers, but they have standpipes. Well, if you if we have a significant fire in there, you're going to have a lot of students in those in that dormitory, and you you're going to need more than one truck, regardless. It'll, it'll go up in alarms, and both UC Davis and the city of Davis could use the, both trucks. Okay, thank you, Ray. You had some questions. Yeah, can you forgive me for putting you on the spot with a what may be a difficult question, but. Your presentation seems to suggest a serious shortfall in firefighting resources, along with incremental requirements coming in the form of more buildings. Have you recommended to the city manager or the planning commission or anybody else that we place a moratorium on new construction until we align the resources with the need and if not, why not? Uh, to answer the question, we've not had that discussion about limiting that. And um, it may be worthwhile to look at that, but we're already down the road on that. Uh, the resource, it's not just about the tall buildings. We, like I said, we already have everything in place in the city. And most all of the other cities our size in California have ladder trucks um, because they need them. Um, and so the city's already has the need for one. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, are there questions for the fire chief? Not I have seen. one more, I'm sorry. It's not related to the fire truck. It's, could you give us any, any backstory or information about Fire Station 31? and why it came up as going into replacement, but nothing has happened over the last about eight years? You know, I caught, can you, I don't mean to throw this back at you with a question, but I heard you say that earlier, you made a reference to it. If you could kind of clarify what you thought that was, I might, a little more information, I might be able to answer that. Yes, so there was a capital, I just look at, I like to look at capital improvement projects, I suppose, in my free time. And Fire Station 31 was one that came up under a project number, a very specific one, 8253. And it has had about $2.5 million plus budgeted to it. And the question ends up becoming, why, why hasn't, like, what's, what's going on? Why is that, why is that budgeted, but not built? And then the fire chief is asking about the replacement cost. Yeah, I think what's that, that is in reference to back in 99 or a little bit later, there was um, some money put aside. I think that's the amount for a fourth fire station because of the response times were too long in the north areas of the city of Davis. And that's in relation to station 31. So the relation is only about, that money can only be used to improve the response times to that area in the north. 
and so it's been sitting there until we could. E we do need a station up there. With there, it, it's longer than the five six minutes that we want to be somewhere in case there's a heart attack or a fire that grows so incredibly fast these days. Um, I think I'm pretty sure that's what that's in relation to. So it is sitting there. I believe the the funds are still allocated for that, but we have to. As I'm trying to prioritize coming into the fire department this last couple of years, truly trying to um, prioritize our needs. Uh, it's one of them, but it's a couple down. I'm planning on addressing that in the near future. And that money is, I think there's specific rules to being able to use it. Believe me, if I could get my hands on it, I'd love to <laughs> replace 31 because that's our headquarters uh, where I'm sitting at today. And we're over the years, it's just, it's just ran its course. We really need to upgrade the station. So in awesome. time. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. David, you had some more questions? Yeah, one more quick one. This is, I think, softer than, than uh, Ray's question goes along the lines of uh, the earlier uh, discussion we had on on priorities for the city that I think Paul and Gurkern was raising this. So, and, and this, and Chief, I'm not sure if this is in, in your area of expertise, but you probably know a lot more about than I do. Was there some consideration given to putting a, a, a mitigation fee on tall construction projects? We've had some recent ones that you alluded to, Lincoln 40, University Mall, part of the CEQA mitigation or other mitigation fee to account for it. So not a moratorium, but something to help pay for the costs for these buildings that would uh, benefit from this kind of aerial truck. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we do have the environmental impact fees that come with the new construction. As far as the details of how, what those fees, how they're encumbered and specifically tied to, they are for public safety. But my response to that is probably just to try to help you understand. We're, we're trying now to get ahead of that. The, frankly, the fire department has um, you know, been, had a lot of fire chiefs over the last several years, uh, almost one a year. Um, and so when I took over the, the helm of this, really looking for that stability, we are looking at those items as this new construction comes up. We've been behind that before. It was always too late because nobody was really, um, previous administrations weren't paying attention to it or they weren't trying because it was either shared management or you know, maybe the police chief was in charge or whatever. Whatever the reasons, um, doesn't matter. That's in the past. We're trying to move forward and we are looking and working with the city planning commission on these new projects and where it's gonna affect for the fire service and how we provide public safety. So it, we are trying to address that now. We're just kind of a little bit behind. Doug, you had a question too? Yeah, a um, couple of things. I just wanted to make a real quick comment about the idea of putting a, um, a higher impact fee on the taller buildings. Um, I don't think that's appropriate because I think that's the community's decision. The community has, has basically decided to limit uh, lower density um, development through measure D and other, other you know, 1% growth uh, limits and that sort of thing. And the community has made a um, strategic uh, value determination to densify in the core of the city and do more infill development rather than building subdivisions on the, on the, on the um, edges of town. So I personally think that fire protection, that is a community responsibility. The community has made this, like I said, value determination I don't think you want to, um, you know, quote, you know, um, tax the people who are the, the builders or the, the future occupants of future dense buildings, if that's what we're trying to encourage as a, as a community in terms of um, uh, smart growth or, um, you know, vision of our city. Um, but so a couple of questions, Chief Tenney. Um, one is you, I think you indicated that the summer fire season, which has become, you know, tremendous in the last several years, it puts a, which puts a tremendous strain on your personnel. And um, it, it puts you in a position where people are overworked and you don't have, you don't have, uh, um, people can't take time off, that sort of thing. So my question is, is, is that right? That's that's more about okay. The the question is um, then. So we as the city get reimbursed by the state for those um, for those costs. Generally speaking, is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. 
so, so it sounds to me like we're in a situation where, again, uh, obviously we're sharing resources and when those emergencies happen, you know, we have to respond and everything else. But we're in a situation as a city where we're talking about hiring more people uh, at a, at a, for our, the, that will be expensed toward our general fund and our taxpayers are going to be paying for that in part because we're providing resources to the state. Um, and it, it's this, I mean, it seems to me that Cal Fire should be hiring these extra guys or something, if that's part of the reasoning or to the extent that that's why we think we need more firefighters on a Davis city payroll. It, it, I'm just wondering why isn't that the responsibility if the, if the state's paying for that ultimately, you know, shouldn't those guys be working for Cal Fire and then, you know, or, or you know, again, I, I, the bottom line is the proposal that you've made tonight is going to impact our city finances. And, but, and you've said that part of the, part of the reason of that is because of the, of the burden that's placed upon our department during state, you know, broader regional fire events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, <clears throat> the automatic and mutual aid system in California is, is undoubtedly the, the best in the world. Uh, and, and that is in part due because of Cal Fire and how they've grown over the years. It's changed over many, many years. Um, it's a it's a, both a positive and a negative. Whereas, <clears throat> when when bad things happen, it's so hard to predict the future. They try very hard to be prepared and predict what's going to happen with these fire seasons. But um, the last seven years have been unprecedented. Clearly, I mean we all know that and have seen what has occurred. The state has been providing extra funding to Cal Fire. They're responsible only for the state response areas. The federal side of it, the Forest Service or whoever, BLM, is responsible for the FRA, federal response areas. Though everything outside of that falls under the local jurisdictions to respond to. And <clears throat> again, it's so hard to predict how and when that's gonna occur. Um, in the last several years, what we refer to as local government, which are the cities and so forth that send out these strike teams and help out California OES. Um, we're now providing, when I would say us, it's Davis, it's, it's across the entire state of California. We're providing over 50% of the resources on these big massive wildfires where homes are burning, people are dying. It's a serious situation and they're still trying to catch up to it but no one agency will ever be able to handle that because it burns in everybody's agency. The best example I can give is this, this last year, what's called the LNU complex um, of multiple fires that were occurring that started over in uh, the Napa area. During the night, uh, burned over the hill, Lake Berryessa and came roaring down at midnight into Winters and Vacaville. And I'm sure all of you saw that and paid attention to it. When that occurred, Davis already had an engine helping a, a fire. The state was already overwhelmed. We were already trying to get help from out of state, but we had an engine down in LA, which they let go and headed back here. We sent, the resources were so low, we sent another grass rig over into Napa to help try to save lives, get people out of there. And then they requested, um, an engine in our West Davis to move over to Winters to cover their fire station because they were fighting all the homes that were on fire. Well, they, they immediately didn't cover the station. They got immediately sucked into the incident to help again, to try to save lives and move people out of the way. These things aren't predictable, but what we know from the past is these summer fires have just been something we've never seen before. And they do, it does require all hands on. So if Davis ever has an incident, um, where it's a wind driven fire and we have a lot of shake roofs like an El Macero, for example, we're gonna need help from them too. And that's what the mutual aid and automatic aid system is all about. And it's also re basically required by law that we help out with that. Now, each time they call us to help, we, we evaluate our personnel, we evaluate whether we can um, provide that um, to the state or to the jurisdiction that's asking for our help. We also respond often during the summer down into Vacaville Fairfield for those wind driven fires down there. And that's just on a, a mutual aid request by the neighboring county. It's not even a Cal OES incident. 
So what I'm trying to do is just paint this picture and try to help you understand that this is a big, it's a big deal. We in California, because of the circumstances, do it better than anybody in the world and are very organized in doing this. But it also, we're, we're challenged by the allocation of resources because everybody has been relying on it for so long, they haven't grown their departments. Um, as their call volumes grow, their population grows, the buildings grow, we haven't been growing with it and we're behind. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. that. That's an excellent response. But my, so for example, when you responded to the LMU fire and the personnel costs, uh, we had firefighters fighting over time and you know, there's other, you know, other costs I'm sure involved. Did, did we receive any sort of uh, uh, compensation or um, uh, reimbursement for those personnel and, and you know, other costs? Yeah, yeah, we do. We have a, there's a, there's a seven party agreement with the state, all the agencies, and they do reimburse for the personnel, for the apparatus and for administrative fees. Okay. <clears throat> So that this is this is just a complicated issue, and as you said, it's um, been changed dramatically in the last few years. But I think it's important that we 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 provide the you know the equipment and the people that we need to in these situations. But it's also important to again the 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 resources that we're working with are City of Davis taxpayer money. And I believe the in, the the main intent of that is to protect, you know, again, primarily our city's residences, residents, and then to be available to help out, you know, its surrounding communities as as needed. Certainly. Yeah. Okay. My other question is, um, on the um, do you have any idea over the past year, or let's say during 2020, how many times in the city of Davis we have needed this specific ladder truck equipment to be rolled over from UC Davis for that, for something that it has that we don't already have. Like you said, the, I think you said the jaws of life are on the, um, the squad truck. And yeah. so, so we have some of this equipment already in our toolbox, but how many times of those 6,000 ballpark figure did, was where were we like calling someone said, Hey, Hey, okay. UCD, we need to fire We need that ladder truck. Or if they weren't available, you know, Dixon, can you guys bring yours over? Do you know? So basically what I had before on the slide here is um, we do know how many times the UCD truck came over to the city. And that was 115 times last year. But the squad itself, where we didn't need the truck because it was a vehicle accident, it was something that they, that we have our own equipment for. Um, the squad went on its own responses 832 times. And so our own truck would replace both of those basically. And so if you put those together, that could be approximately 947 times last year out of the 6,000. Okay. So it, yeah, we, it would roll 900 times, but in, but as I said, right now the squad truck has functionality that a ladder truck has some functionality that the ladder truck would also have. So again, it, we and we know that the UCD um, ladder truck rolled into Davis 115 times last year, but not all of those necessarily required the use of the that specialized equipment, that ladder. For or, those or two pieces whatever. of equipment, it, I would say yes. For those two pieces of equipment, yes. And then let me re-emphasize that the Squad 31 only has two firefighters on it. It is not an independent company. They can't go to fires or they don't go to anything by themselves. They always go with an engine company. And if we don't have one available, then we send the UC Davis um, uh, engine to go with our squad. You know, they go there first to see if they can help mitigate, but we always have a, a, a supervisor, an engine company on the way. They're not independent. Um, they just carry specialized, you know, some of that specialized tool, technical rescue, basically ropes and stuff, the auto extrication, some basic fire tools like SCBAs, axes, and things like that, um, airbags for auto extrication, um, and then just medical equipment in case they come upon something where they have to do some medical care for somebody. Um, and so by having a truck and not having a squad anymore, it's an independent company and can respond to everything but grass fires and, and vehicle fires. Um, they would be able to pick up all the simultaneous calls, which is the one third from the bottom there in the middle 
574 times a year, there's a second call at 31 that's, there's nobody there to respond to. It has to come from an outlying station, which means a delay. And if they're not available, that means it's coming from Woodland West Sac or some other jurisdiction. Appreciate it, Chief. Yeah, Thanks you're for welcome. the presentation Thank and info. Thank you for the questions. I appreciate it and the opportunity to explain some of it. Are you sure there's any further questions for the fire chief? I'm not seeing any. So thank you, Chief Tenney, for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, commissioners, I want to find out what your desire is right now. Do you want to have further discussion about some of our earlier comments and concerns, or what would you like to do at this point? If there's public comment, I'd like to hear them, but I would also like to make a few few comments. Sure. Um, we called for public comment already, but we can do that. Did we? We did call for it, right, Elena? At the beginning, and there wasn't any. We did, and there wasn't any. Uh, I guess. Do you want to do it again? No, no, nope, we're good. Okay. Okay. I thought maybe somebody heard something from the commit because of the fire chief's presentation that raised something, but okay, that's fine. You, know, you can certainly call again if anyone's got a raised hand, no trouble with that. We wanna see if there, there's anyone who wants to speak now. Opportunity, we do have a couple of attendees and if you'd like to speak or make a public comment, um, please do a raise hand. And it doesn't look like we have anybody um, at this time to who want to speak. David, go ahead. Okay, well, I'll get it started. So um, I, I was interested in the conversation with the chief and, and the commissioners because I didn't know we would get into the issue, do we need this, um, this uh, aerial ladder truck? I thought that was outside, perhaps outside the purview of the commission, but I see them directly related the finance issue and whether we need it. But it, assuming we need it, um, and, and, that's, and, and if that's been demonstrated satisfactorily, then I thought we engage on how do we provide the finances to achieve that? What are some ideas? I threw that fire mitigation uh, fee as a possibility. Um, and I appreciate what Doug's saying and just another development fee. Yeah, it is. But the question is, if you need that truck, how can you do it in a way that is sensible put some of those costs on the beneficiary and I would see the taller buildings as more of a beneficiary than somebody that's living in a residential area. But there's other ideas as, as Paul Unger can point it out, there's parcel taxes. And again, it's a question of fairness. So I'm not advocating for any of those. I'm just throwing those out. My real focus though is my question would be though, assuming we need it, what is the most cost effective way to acquire that truck and I haven't heard a conversation on that and that's sort of my issue all the time. What's the best way to proc procure that truck? And that raises questions as to whether we need a new truck or can we get a used truck? That might save uh, some money. Can't, should we buy the truck or should we lease the truck? And if we lease it, is there an option out there, which I believe there is where you can lease to own eventually. So save us some money on the upside. We'll essentially have an installment purchase program. So th those are questions to look at the procurement. The other thing that I'm interested in is, I'm guessing this is one of the largest, if not the largest procurement of a good by the city in a while. So now I'm talking about a real estate purchase or a consulting contract, a good purchase. So what is the strategy that the city has to achieve the most cost-effective purchase, assume we go the purchase route. How do we advertise it? How do we negotiate it? Who's on that team? So those would be my questions. And you know, I've been trying to look at some of our contracting practices uh, relating to fire and, and police, and I haven't been able to make any conclusions. Maybe we have a great contracting uh, system, but we should look into that because it sounds like an, an important purchase if that's what we do. So that'd be my recommendation part of it. What is our contracting process and how will it achieve, make sure that we achieve the best price possible for the city? 
So those are great points and you're right. I, I don't think that the two documents we've looked at so far really hit on that. So those are really good points that I think we would want to add to whether we combine the memos and however we do it. Those are really important points. And, it, and as you were talking, it made me wonder if this ladder truck, because just to back up here, I know David, you've been looking at some of the other safety procurements. And one of the things that I had learned is that many of them, we, we um, don't do our own, we don't have our own individually negotiated contracts. We actually use master services agreements or the CMAS agreements that state agencies use. So I don't even know if that is a possibility for the purchase of a fire ladder truck like this. And for those of you who don't know that process, for certain goods or services that the state purchases in bulk or a lot, it negotiates what it considers to be the best deal because it's gonna kind of guarantee that it buys a lot of this thing. And then the in, in local governments can avail themselves of those prices as well. So that's a, those are great points about what is the most cost-effective way to make the purchase. And I think that should be built into our, whatever recommendation we do make. Um, uh, Ray, you had your hand up first and then Ezra and then Paul. So, Ray, yes, um, I understand the argument for a new ladder truck, especially in the context of more resources altogether. I have to balance that against the structural budget deficit and all of the other infrastructure and other needs the city has. And with that in mind, I would move that the Finance and Budget Commission forward the uh, Busby Beeman Neville memo as a recommendation to council with all the pronoun I's changed to we. Second, Beeman. Can we, can we sort of entertain, um, I guess what is a friendly amendment? I think it's important to combine both memos, both the one that Ezra, what I would propose is that we take both of the existing memos and we consolidate them to avoid redundancy. And then we add wording um, to, the, to whatever memo we submit that reflects the concerns that David just raised, which is that the council, to the extent that it does decide to go ahead with a purchase, it really needs to analyze the most cost-effective means of doing so um, and we could, you know, add a sentence or so about what some of those possible methods are, but that's really key. I wouldn't want to lose that in the discussion. But, um, um, sorry, I think, uh, Paul, you had your hand up and then Doug. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, Paul, then Ezra, and then Doug. Sorry. I, I'm just struck by thinking about the, uh, the city has limited resources. The forecast model that the city has been using and putting in the budget and making more available assumes that we're adding about one more staff person a year. I mean, there were substantial cuts made in 2008. That was a 20%. It was lots of people. And subsequently, I mean, and the notion is going forward, we may, probably can afford about one more a year and then we're gonna, things will be tight for a few years, but then they get better. Um, now we're talking about adding three or six more firefighters with the attendant uh, additional uh, firefighters are covered by public safety plans. And even though the newer plans are uh, in terms of retirement, even though the newer plans are more uh, favorable to the city, uh, they still, it's still expensive. Um, I'm just concerned that the, the chief makes a good case that we need more firefighters after cuts of past years and not any increases until last year, a, a year and a half ago. But how is this going to affect the total budget? I mean, and this is, this is the problem we have. We don't really have resources. To me, this is really should be a state, a top state priority to help local governments improve fire service because 
the state relies on those for these massive fires that we've been having it, with more and more frequency. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to make of what I've just said, but, but in the end, I, it, this, re, this is a real dilemma. And as much as you'd like to beef up our fire department, um, do we have the resources to do this? So um, Ezra, you had your hand up and now I'm not seeing it up. I don't not. I, he did, that's correct. Go ahead, Ezra. Um, I, I'm just looking at the time here. I mean, I feel like yeah. uh, we did not get this presentation before the meeting. We weren't prepared, you know, we didn't budget the time for it. Um, we've gone down a path. I mean, I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, we can put forward our feedback and maybe circle back because, you know, I think we're all focused on a ladder truck and do we need four stories, but it's, it's a, it's a wider question. So, I, I mean, I feel like we didn't follow sort of protocol here. Um, I'm not really appreciative of, of the chief showing up and, 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 being able to answer questions, but you know, not prepared, would have would have done things differently. Um, so maybe, and it's nine thirteen. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just feeling a little frustrated. All my kids are asleep now. Um, so, commissioners, well, I Don, Donna, um, just as a I guess suggestion, I'm not sure if this is, you know, um, something that the commissioners want to consider, um, plus what obviously Ezra said, um, is that, do you, do you want to discuss it further at your April meeting? Do you want to bring it back for further discussion? Obviously it's a fairly large purchase and important, so, um, do you so, no that's a good point and i was of the understanding that there was some urgency around that and i i don't know when council's going to take it up do you know if they're going to take this up before our april meeting um well i i believe that um as i mentioned just now that i think it's fairly large and fairly important item um and certainly in terms of dollar amount and financial standpoint, it is within, um, you know, a VC's purview and um, for discussion. Um, so the idea was to try and bring it back to council at, um, well, it, I would say March meeting, but um, I think the schedule was rescheduled because of the uh, workshop that council was having. Uh, for the goal setting and um, it would be probably if so April but I think it's important enough if you believe that it's important enough to bring it back for third, further discussion that you still have ability to do that. Well I think our task was not to make a recommendation on, on whether the fire truck should or shouldn't be purchased. It was to review city staff analysis and, and to comment on it and I think that our comments are, are still really valid, um, although we did hear from the, the fire chief and you know, he, did, he did provide some, some clarification and information that wasn't in the analysis. So if anything, I would just say that our comments should still stand because a lot, some of our comments you know, need to be responded to in the staff analysis rather than in a you know discussion that we got tonight. So I'm I'm amenable either way. If if folks are want to wrap up and take this up at the next meeting to conclude, I'm fine with that. But I, I want to do whatever's sort of the pleasure of the commissioners, how you want to proceed here. I think we have three hands up. So Donna. Mm -hmm. David. Okay, sure. Um, there's a motion on the floor that um, Ray Main, you offered uh, a friendly amendment, as I understood it, was to submit uh, the two written documents that we have with my addition to look at the contracting process. I would support that, and I feel comfortable with that because I really don't have a recommendation because I don't have all the information. So, if, so I would I would support if the goal is to get a recommendation from us. I'm not prepared to vote on that, but if the goal is to daylight this issue. 
let staff com comment on it and provide a, a more thoughtful analysis to the city council, I'm ready because I think the written documents I've seen do, do that. So okay. I would support the motion on the floor. Is there a S3. second? Yeah, and me. Is, is that a second, Ezra? Yeah, I seconded it the first time. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, still, oh. I'm still seconding. And okay. I accept so I the... Think <laughs> yeah, I accept the addition of the uh, Sufi Jacobs document for additional uh, submission, along with the additional Sandino comments. Great, great. Um, good. Is there further debate on that motion? Uh, I have seen two hands up, but I don't think they're meant to be up, David and Ray. No. And Sorry. Paul, I, just, you... I just wonder, so please... If this motion passes, what's the next step, Donna? You well, just basically you would present we have, these. We, we would present for, these to the council. We have that. Yes, our comments would then be merged into kind of a single document and sent. I think really they'd go back. I think to city staff and perhaps the council as well. But I'm hopeful that staff would probably revise their analysis somewhat yeah. based on our comments. Yeah. That's what I. Hope I, I don't think they need to be merged. Okay, that's fine. That you know, two documents, and then we add in the language David um, described related to contracting. That's fine, and and let city staff work with our concerns and comments. I mean, that's what we were tasked with. Great. Yep. Do we vote now? So I'm going to call the vote. Um, Commissioner Beeman. Aye. Commissioner Busby. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Neville? Aye. Commissioner Salmon? Aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Very good. So that passes. And I will get that to staff and council as quickly as I can. And I'm, I apologize and I, uh, to everyone because I know we are over time and we even have a rule. It's now 919. We have a rule that we're supposed to have a motion to go past nine if we're starting another item. Um, the only thing left on the agenda is the um, uh, subcommittee reports, and my sense is that there are none. Is that correct? That no correct one for me. Okay. And so, is there, Elena? Is there any public comment on the um, subcommittee reports? On the um, item seven. So, whether there's anyone who wants to make public comment on item seven, the subcommittee reports. So I do not see any hands raised. Very good. Um, no comment in that. And then we don't need to discuss the long range calendar. There's no significant changes. So thank you everyone. I appreciate your patience as we work through all this stuff. Um, so I'm just gonna, is there a motion to adjourn? Solomon, okay. so move. <laughs> don't all speak at once. <laughs> well, I mean, just before we dial off, um, I, I did want to recognize the extra effort you put into this, and which I think, you know, was fantastic. We were all organized to have comment ready on what is a complex topic. So I think that's important that we recognize your efforts there, Donna. And we just wanted to say thanks for that. And yeah, I agree. We just Most definitely. had this left field thing come in. Anyway. No worries. No, it's, it's all good. I didn't, I knew we, I knew it could be a lot, a lot to talk about. So yeah, but we're good. So um, also second. So I'm just going to call the roll. Commissioner Beeman. Aye. Commissioner Busby. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Neville. Aye. Commissioner Salmon. Aye. Commissioner Sandino. Aye. Commissioner Sufi. Aye. Excellent. So we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Good night.